In this lecture, we're going to be talking about data preparation and screening. And what this really is, it's an extension of what we did in Stats 1 with descriptive statistics. We're going to be talking about how to look at um, our multivariate data to make sure that everything is, is set to go for analysis. So the, this is a list of some of the things we're going to cover. We're going to spend a lot of time on number two, which is m missing data. And I want to talk about some ways to look at if your data, um, if you have missing data, what to do with it and how to know if it's OK to, to move forward with it. So one of the first things we're going to look at is, is normality. And again, we, we've already done the steps of looking at descriptives of our data, looked for outliers and looked for other things. Now we're going to be looking at the multivariate portion of it. So just as a reminder, when we're looking at normality, we're looking at skewness and kurtosis. So in this slide, we're talking about skewness. We've got two slides on the uh, two figures on the bottom. Uh, the, the one on the left is a positively skewed distribution, and I know it's positively skewed. The tail goes is in the positive direction, and the one on the right is a negatively skewed distribution because the tail is on uh, heading in the, the negative direction. So I, I always look at where the tail is at in these distributions, and that tells me if it's this one is negative and this one on the left is a positively skewed distribution. So when we look at the, the when we do descriptives, we can get um, a number for skewness. And when we look at that number, there's some rules of thumb with this. If it's greater than three, we might have a skewed distribution. Um, again, that's a rule of thumb. It's not a, a hard and fast rule. I've seen different rules in different places. Uh, this is listed in Tabachnik and Fidel. And then another test we can do is a z-test. So if we look at that number in SPSS or whatever statistical software we're using, and we look at the standard error of that number, if we take two times that standard error, we can create a 95% confidence interval. So if we add uh, two times that standard error to our number, and then we subtract two times that standard error of that number, we get a confidence interval. If zero is in that confidence interval, we would say it's not uh, significantly skewed. So that gives us another way. It's, it's almost like a, a, a test of skewness. So again, if we multiply that standard error of the number, and I'll show you this in SPSS, and um, we add it and subtract it to our, our estimate, of skewness, um, we get a, a test basically. And that, uh, that test is not perfect, it's just another a rule of thumb that we can kind of look at. In large samples, the test is almost always significant, so not necessarily a perfect test um, in, in large samples. Um, the other part of that is looking at kurtosis. So we've got skewness, skewness which is if it's being pulled in the direction of a tail uh, kurtosis is how flat or how peaked that curve is that normal curve and the way that i remember this i think of a negative uh, kurtosis is platykurtotic that's almost like a duck bill so a platy or a platypus so that's i remember platy um, for a, a, a negative kurtosis and that's when it's really flat um, and then leptokurtotic is when it's in positive direction. In this example here, we've got a um, really steep curve, a normal distribution, and that's a leptokurtotic distribution. So in this example here, our kurtosis is 26. That's um, pretty platy, uh, leptokurtotic. Um, and DiCarlo says greater than eight is troublesome. I, I think, um, Troublesome is a relative word. It depends on what you're doing with the data. So we, we want to look at these these numbers. I, I think um, skewness is, is um, troublesome for some statistics and, and kurtosis might be for others, but uh, we, we just want to always know where we're at with these numbers. If we have a distribution that is skewed or kurtotic, there's some things we can do with it and we can transform the data. Uh, we can basically take the data, multiply it by something, and so the, the distribution becomes less skewed or less kurtotic. This is not something that I do very often. This is something that I, I sort of reserve in worst case scenarios. Um, so here are some examples of things that you can do. Um, so if you've got extreme outliers in different tails, you can um, do it by uh, 
take an odd root of the number. Um, if you've got a, a negative kurtosis, you can do um, like a, a cube of the function. Um, sometimes we've got with uh, reaction time data, we have things that are, are positively skewed. And this is maybe the one time that I'll do um, a transformation is with reaction time data. So basically you have people reacting relatively normal and then once in a while their attention fades and they have this really positively skewed distribution where they have a few scores that are really, really high. So that might be a time where you might transform the data. I, again, one of the reasons we don't do this is just makes interpretation of the data really difficult when you're talking about a uh, um, square root transformation of the data and you're talking about what that means. It just, it just uh, makes it uh, more difficult for people to understand. So when we look at outliers, we've looked at this with univariate data, uh, but with multivariate data, we have to look at it, how it relates to um, each, each of these functions together. So I like this example on the bottom. So if we have age as one of our variables, being 15 years old is a very normal age to, to have in our distribution. Um, if we've got salary in our distribution, 45000 is probably a very normal salary to have in the distribution. But a 15-year-old making 45000 that's not something that's usual. So taking these two variables together, the multivariate part of it, um, that's when it's not normal anymore. It's, it's, it's an outlier uh, multivariately. And so we need to look at these type of things. And one of the best ways to look at this is using... Um, using scatter plots. So here we've got our, um, a few scatter plots and there are some there's some terminology that goes along with this. And we, we've got leverage discrepancy and influence and the Tabachnik and Fidel chapter talks in great detail about these and here are the descriptions of them. But I, I think these figures really show this. Um, for this first figure on the left, uh, this outlier here um, is pretty in line with the data. And we can almost imagine that if we had more data that it would just fit right in this pattern. So this one doesn't have a lot of influence on the data. If we created a regression line, it would kind of fit right in with that. Um, this one in the middle, um, this one is very discrepant, way over on this far, far right here. It doesn't seem like it is in line with a regression line from this data. So this one has, it's highly discrepant, far, far away. Um, it's got a lot of leverage. If we draw a regression line for this one, it really just pulls it uh, way down here. So it's really pulling this it's, um, down towards that, that data point. Um, and then here's, here's another one that's uh, discrepant from the rest of the data, but it has less influence on this data. It maybe changes the regression line a little bit, but um, it doesn't um, influence it as much. All right, so one of the important issues and in, in when you have real life data, not the data sets in classes, just missing data and what that missing data means. So instead of uh, the term missing seems kind of odd, I always, I, so I've always thought, it's not like you've lost it and you're, you've just got to uncover it and find it someplace. It's just, it's, it's data that people have either dropped out or it's incomplete. So things that you'd like to have, but you just don't have it. So what we want to do with missing data is to come up with a data set that's realistic and that tells the story for our data. So some of the things that people do with clinical studies, if a person drops out, they'll take that last point and whatever number it is, they'll take that same point and add it in for all of the other values going forward. So that's one way to do it. It may bias our results is going to be more conservative for our results, but that might not be exactly what we want to do. So we're going to talk about some ways to um, look at how to, uh, what to do with missing data if it's a problem, and then what to do in, in replacing that data if we want to replace it. So that's uh, sometimes it's a scary thing to replace missing data. So Ruben has. Um, written quite a bit on this topic and he talks about his, his theory of incomplete data. So I'm going to call it incomplete um, as much as possible, but he, he came up with some terms. So he has missing completely at random or MCAR and MCAR is basically if you 
nobody's got paper data probably anymore, but if you had a bunch of, of paper data and you're walking back to an office and the wind blows and some of the data disappears, it's missing completely at random. There's no reason um, for that data to be missing or incomplete. It blew off in the wind and the wind just picked data randomly. So that's missing completely at random. There's no bias. Missing at random that that sort of next level is that there might be some clues um, in the data set of why the data is missing, but it's not enough to, to make it biased. So we, we have some idea of why that data might be missing, but it, our results are still not biased enough to, to really say that we can't um, go forward with the data. And then non-ignorable missing is when the da data is missing for a reason and it biases our results. So everybody who dropped out of the study um, just hated the treatment so much that they dropped out. So that's that uh, biases our results. So the people who stayed in the study liked it enough to stay in it. And so there might be a bias. Liking is maybe not the best example here, but uh, I hope you understand what I mean. So let's look at some, some data and talk about these patterns of incompleteness. And um, what I'm going to look at is some data with uh, depression. And, and what this data set is, it's a large data set of, of high school kids. And they were looking at school abilities. But they also measured depression with this these kids. So we're going to look at ninth grade depression and 10th grade incompleteness to determine if that relates to uh, missingness in the data set. So it's a lot on this next slide, but let me kind of describe what we have here. So in this box, we have an example of some of our data. So we've got all of the kids measured in ninth grade on their depression measure. So we see their depression scores here. We look at their 10th grade depression and we've got the scores here. We've got a person three is missing and person five is missing. So what I did was create a missing variable, uh, missing variable variable. Um, so in this new variable here, if you're missing in the 10th grade, you get a one. If you're not missing, you get a zero. So person three gets a one, person five gets a one. And this is a pretty easy type of thing to, to create. I just did a compute statement, gave everybody a zero, and then I did a second compute statement. If missing, give them a one. So uh, that's a new variable here. And then what I did with this was with this missing value variable, I wanted to use this as an outcome variable and it's a, a dichotomous variable, so I did a logistic regression. So I'm predicting whether a person is missing or not. So the DV is whether they're missing or not. And then I did um, use ninth grade depression as a predictor of missingness. Uh, so what I have here is the logistic regression results. And there's you know, some of the things on the top that we see the number of people. That's not super important for this example. Our R square, it's not a very good predictor. Um, again, not important. We're not trying to predict this as best as possible. But what we're trying to do is to look at whether depression in the ninth grade predicts whether a person is missing in the 10th grade. And so what we have here at the end, this is the, the the p-value, so the probability that the null hypothesis is, is, is true is 0 0.0583. So we wouldn't reject the null hypothesis that ninth grade depression and 10th grade depression are, are unrelated. So we'll basically say um, that we don't see a relationship between ninth grade depression and missingness. Um, this is a pretty close to significant. So I, I think what I might say is we have some clues as to why people are missing. It might be related to depression in the ninth grade. It's just not significantly related. If it were significantly related, we might have some non-ignorable missingness. That depression in the ninth grade predicted whether people dropped out of school and then are missing in the 10th grade. Um, so I would call this missing at random using Rubin's uh, scheme of, of naming things. So we have cues as to why people are missing, but we don't know exactly for sure the reason. Um, so we just think depression is related to it, but uh, not enough that we can't move forward with this data. All right, so what do we do with incomplete data? So in 
a lot of our methods that we've learned in the first stats class, so with a t-test or repeated measures ANOVA is probably the best example. If you don't have complete data at every single time point, that person is just completely deleted. So we can't use that person's data. So let's say we have five time points, you're measuring somebody through therapy, you've got them pre-therapy uh, at the beginning um, or in the middle, in the end at the, and then the very end again, and then six months later. Um, I don't know if that equals five points, but you have five data points. If they miss the six month follow-up, that person gets deleted and you don't have any, you, you don't use their data in that repeated measures of NOVA. It's just com that person's completely deleted. Um, that's probably not what we want to do. Um, and in the, in the later weeks in this class, we're going to talk about other methods that are probably better than repeated measures of NOVA for that situation. But if we were just stuck with repeated measures of NOVA, we're going to have to figure out what to do. You know, how do we analyze this data where we don't lose uh, half of our people who didn't have the follow-up data. So one of the things we could do, this is a, the, the, well, I guess with the deleting the people, um, it's very simple. It's widely done. Anytime you do repeated measures ANOVA, people are just deleted. You lose a lot of information with this type of technique. Uh, you could lose half your people if you're just talking about a six-month follow-up or a year follow-up. Um, you're increasing your standard errors because you have a smaller sample size, you have bigger standard errors, and um, we don't know why those people are no longer in the study, so it could bias our results. So we want to look at a different way. Instead of just deleting people who have missing data, we want to find other ways. So another way we could do this is what's called mean substitution. So we're going to just take the mean of everyone else and substitute it in for that, that person. So the advantage to this, it's relatively simple. We can just take a mean from everybody, add it in. It's clear what you did. So if you're trying to describe it to other people, um, I just took the mean of everybody and just said that this person was average. Um, so it it's, makes sense. Um, but what happens is we lose our true mean because this person is probably not exactly the average. So uh, maybe all the people who left the study were um, had higher depression scores. So we've, we've now adjusted or biased our results. So and we also um, have incorrect standard errors because now the mean, everybody who's missing has the mean. So what it does, it makes our standard errors uh, much smaller um, and, and kind of changes things. So let me show you an example. Um, this is syntax of how it was done. So basically we calculated a mean for a depression score in the ninth grade, a mean for the depression score in 10th grade, and um, we did a plot of these these scores. And let me, what do you, I want to show you this plot and do you notice anything that that's strange about this data? So what we have is you see a line here at 16 and then a line here at 14. So a lot of data points in these two points or in these two lines. And this is anybody who was missing, we just substituted 16 um, for for the tenth or for the ninth grade. And then maybe it's 14 for the ninth grade and then 16 for the 10th grade. So we have these, these lines and it, it kind of makes your, your figure look pretty funny too. Let me take away the, um, the ink on this slide. And so it, it, it's kind of a, a, a odd looking slide as well. Um, if you were to show this in a, a poster session, uh, people might come up and um, laugh at you. Not that I have personal experience. No, I, um, this is just something that would look a little strange with this. And it also, again, it biases our results. This person up here got a mean of um, for this ninth grade that to look like everybody else, but probably wasn't like everybody else in ninth grade because in, in 10th grade, this person is, is really high in depression. Um, so, so anybody in these extremes, you know, this person also was probably not at the average um, as well in, in in 10th grade, um, being in ninth grade, this person was one of the highest people on the, the SESD score. So again, it can really bias our results when we do this mean substitution. 
So another approach is to do a regression approach. And, and what we do with this is instead of substituting a, an average, we predict where they would be based on other people's score. So if another person in ninth grade had a 60, um, we would kind of predict where they're at, where that person is at in tenth grade as we use that prediction for, for others. We're basically creating a regression line um, and using that regression line to predict people. So I'll show you this. Uh, these are our regression coefficients and then if 10th grade depression is missing, then their score for that person equals um, the intercept plus the slope times their ninth grade score. So we basically have a regression line that we're going to use to predict uh, 10th grade depression if they're missing and ninth grade depression if they're missing. So this is just syntax to kind of show it to you. There's, there's some easier ways to do this, and this is SPSS and, or SAS syntax. So um, there might be, you know, it's, it, we could do it a little bit simpler, but I just wanted to show you all of this syntax. So again, when we look at this figure here, we've got a, a similar type of problem as we did before, where we have two lines where we can see people were just substituted. And here's one of them, and it's just, it matches the regression line. So we're predicting the, where these people are based on where they were in um, 10th grade or 9th grade. And then the same thing here, we've got another regression line and we just predicted missing people based on where we think they would be. Um, so this is a little bit more accurate. It looks better than the mean substitution. At least they're in line with where they should be. But it again, it biases our, our data. We've got this perfect regression line built into it. So our standard error looks like it's smaller. We've biased our results. So there's another way to do this. And this is what's called multiple imputation where basically we're creating some error around that random, that regression line. This is a pretty rough way to do this. This is a, like a, maybe the way that we used to do it back in the old days, where we create a um, random number around it, and this allows the number to vary around that regression line. And there are some newer ways. So let me show you this figure right here. You can't really see any of those lines in here because what we've done is taken that that score they'd get on the regression and added some random error to it. So what we have now, though, with multiple imputation, there's a lot more advanced techniques where in SPSS, it will create a distribution of possible scores that this person has been in. And it will bootstrap those those uh, possible scores over and over and over again and find uh, an average of those those possible scores. So what it does, it creates a figure that looks like this, but it's it's taking thousands of, of potential samples to figure out where the per they guess that person would be. So it's a little bit, it's a much better technique than these other techniques that I've been mentioning. Um, reviewers in manuscripts don't always like multiple imputation because what you're doing is you're putting in scores for people that actually don't have that score. So you can see some potential issues with that is that we want to have accurate data that we've actually collected and if you do that review uh, some reviewers will just say you just created data out of nothing. So what I often do with this is when I do multiple imputation and it depends on the journal and different things. Uh, for example, uh, physical therapy, they wanted um, multiple imputation. Uh, their journal editors want that. Um, so what I did was I did multiple imputation and then I did it without multiple imputation and, and showed the results and hopefully the results line up together. And, and if they don't, then you're into, a, you know, you're into describing why you think the results don't line up. But if you can run it without multiple imputation and then with it and the results line up, then you're golden on your interpretation. So that's multiple imputation. These are some of the things we'll do with uh, missing data. Um, however, I think for... Um, as we get into other statistics like multi-level modeling and some of the things that we'll do, um, we can handle missing data in different ways and probably what I think are better ways.